thing I want to say is that um, sometimes I'm called a blogger, sometimes I'm called a citizen journalist, or a town crier, or a rabble rouser, or the destructor of the Obama administration and all of our legacy organizations. So I sort of feel like that sometimes I'm under siege, sometimes I'm hailed as some kind of pioneer, and it's probably a little bit of everything. Uh, but I have to say that my colleagues, and I say that loosely, some of the bloggers that I have met and know and meet frequently um, when we go to conferences only, uh, we all share the same commitment for equality and to equality. And uh, I think it's hard to say what our roles are, but I think that the best way we can describe it as, is that we want to affect change from the perspective of being a single person, an individual, uh, sharing what they know and what they experience where they live. I think one of the things that often gets me an invitation here is because of my perspective of a lesbian, a person of color, and I live in the South. Um, I cover a, co a few demographics that make that an interesting mix, a way to talk about things in a subject. So um, a couple of examples of how uh, bloggers have been effective, and in this case, I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples that, is tr that are true about um, having one person change a political race, in one case, and one to stop an anti-trans uh, campaign that was born of just ignorance and how to point it out, get sponsors to take, uh, take advantage of uh, threats and become effective in just using social media and blog posts and partnering with one of our legacy organizations. So it actually does happen sometimes. So the first message is the new media and political impact. After Senator Kay Hagan was elected in 2008, uh, one of the things that uh, bothered the LGBT media there and myself is that she had refused to take any questions from LGBT media. She had been advised that uh, even bringing up the issue was somehow dangerous and would pose a problem. So when it was time for Richard Burr to run for re-election, I said, well, this isn't gonna happen, not on my watch, not in my state. Uh, I want the Democrats to go on the record. How hard is that to have a page on your website describing where you fall on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is an active issue that you might vote on if you are in the Senate. So I asked politely for all of them to participate in a live blog so they could talk to my readers, answer questions, and I even gave them the option of having all of the questions in advance to vet them. Um, Elaine Marshall's campaign jumped on the opportunity, had a liaison with me, working to work with her on how to craft her page. She had no problem, neither did Ken Lewis. Cal Cunningham was very interesting. Um, he refused to answer any of my requests. Uh, in fact, I was very polite. I just said, there's no way he can turn me down on this. His other two rivals for the nomination are already going to go on the record. Finally, since I wasn't getting a response, and I honestly did want to know what he thought about these issues, was to put his face on a milk carton and put a post on my blog, put it on Daily Coast, and lo and behold, my cell phone rang as I was driving home from work, and it was his campaign manager saying, how can I do something about this? Um, and thinking I was a rube, that uh, he wouldn't bother uh, following up and getting it done in time, I just said, look, I'm making an endorsement in three days. If you want to do it after I endorse, make an endorsement, that's fine. Uh, so, <laughs> so I endorsed Elaine Marshall. He still, to his credit, came on and did the live blog because he realized he was embarrassed. So I know that next time we have an election, we're going to get people on the record and have them have their thoughts and their views on their web pages so people can decide. That's all I wanted was for people to be able to decide among the candidates. Um, so using Cover It Live, which is a great tool, um, you can have everything happening in real time. And when I promoted it on Facebook and Twitter, you know, I had hundreds of people wanting, waiting in line trying to get in their questions. Fortunately, you can moderate it to eliminate trolls. Uh, but there were really not any trolls. People really wanted to know all around the country, what was North Carolina going to do in presenting their nominee to run against Richard Burr? Of course, you know, we had the midterms, the big sweep, and now North Carolina has a Republican led General Assembly for the first time since Reconstruction. So we've got a lot of work to do in my state. And the second example is an example of a radio program. Uh, this is the, what the live blogging looked like. Um, they both had pictures taken live and they were able to see, people were able to see and interact with them as they were doing the live blog. I thought that was really cool. Uh, blog swarming, the second example. Um, 
my blogger colleagues, we do not sit and have meetings and plan out everything. We just actually decide an issue is so important, we all want to write about it at the same time to get the attention of the media, to get attention of our organizations, and just to try to push a story. That happens rarely, but it does happen. So we did have a story break on Pam's House Blend uh, about a radio program called Rob, Arnie, and Dawn in the Morning Show. Uh, this was done by Autumn Sandine. This was not my story. She actually did it on, on our blog. And on one of the radio stations, this is what aired. And it's more of a political bull crap that you don't want to tell a kid he's a freak, and had a lisp, cause, it may cause us to hurt his feelings. If my son, God forbid, if my son put on a pair of high heels, I would probably hit him with one of my shoes. I would throw a shoe at him because, you know what, boys don't wear high heels. OK, that's heinous. Uh, it didn't go unnoticed. So we did have a blog post about it, asked others to blog about it. We sent out um, a response from GLAD to help partner with us on this to spread the word. And as a result, it only took a few days when we had ad cancellations, massive sets of ad cancellations. And they actually decided to have an on-air apology and had um, a transgender person on to actually talk about the issue and why the ignorance was there and how they can stop doing it. So I consider that a huge victory that happened just from blog swimming. And all of this did happen because of the use of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, these, you, the one thing that bloggers have had to do, because a lot of us can be really verbose, is to figure out the universe of 140 characters. You get really good at getting a message in, and you've got to leave enough message space, character space, to retweet and to modify a tweet. Uh, I teach a social media class, so this is a lot of this stuff I'm teaching to people who really want to use this in their work. Um, and it is something you have to do. You can't ignore it. And it happens, and it happens really fast. So if you have an application, I don't know how many people here use Hootsuite or TweetDeck, where you can follow streams of people all the time. We do that, uh, our, my colleagues, and we make sure we push messages of one another and links, because we'd all want to write about the things that may affect equality. And one of the things that I didn't have on the slide set, but I wanted to talk about, was the fact that the blogosphere isn't funded, it's self-funded. Almost every one of us uh, has a full-time job. We use that to subsidize our time to go and travel. Making money on um, ad revenue alone is, is not something that anyone can plan to do. Uh, you really don't want to count on that because it, I've seen my ad revenue dry up. I've seen it go up or down, depending on what the political cycle it is. Uh, but I think that it's not an easy model. There's no real model for monetizing it as a movement entity. Um, I wish I had the, the magic uh, potion to make this happen, but I think that we have to admit that even our best and brightest uh, members of the blogosphere could go away at any time. Uh, they may lose their job and have to fall offline and have to do something. We can't count on them to be there. Uh, I work in a, at a university, so I don't have to worry about getting fired for my expressing my opinion, but that may not be true. In North Carolina, you can you lose your job just for being LGBT. So I think that we all have to take time and think about what is the blogosphere worth to our movement? Are we, are we okay with people sliding in, sliding out with different levels of political savvy or not? Uh, it's hard to figure out if we're, the long term is good for us to have a blogosphere. I think there is value in this, but I don't know if we're okay with it being a rotating group of people who are independently um, finding time to fit this in as opposed to something that is their full-time passion. So I've decided to make it my full-time passion, but I still have to have that day job. I have to have the third job. So we're all tired, most of them, if you talk to every one of us, but we're really committed to the movement and want you all to know that it's something that isn't sustainable as it is now but I think that we'll have to think of some good ways to try to make it possible to make full-time commitments to equality.